In today's webinar, we will discuss the future of trade shows, technology, competition, and the customer experience. Our expert moderator and lively panelists will answer questions during the last 10 to 15 minutes of our webinar, so please join in. Alternatively, you can join the conversation and ask questions on Twitter, hashtag TSNNWebinar at any time. Now, Arlene Shows, Marketing Manager for TSNN, would like to say a few words. Hello from TSNN and welcome. Each year, TSNN presents our most popular webinar of the year on the subject of trade show technology, and today's content will not disappoint. According to a panelist, Francis Friedman, the trade show industry is about to have its head handed to it. He'll explain why shortly, so pay close attention and thanks for tuning in. Big thanks to our devoted sponsors, Signature Boston, MCCA, and OnStream Media. With their support, we are able to deliver these educational topics to you free of charge. Many thanks goes out to Signature Boston and the Massachusetts Convention Center Authority. They own and operate the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center and the Heinz Convention Center. Boston certainly pre represents unique benefits and advantages of bringing an event there, including state-of-the-art facilities, first-class hotels, unique history, culture, and top-notch services, including free Wi-Fi throughout the BCEC and the Heinz. Another round of thanks goes out to OnStream Media. All of TSN's webinars are brought to you by OnStream Media, the leader in multimedia webinar and webcasting services. They are a leading online service provider of corporate audio and web communications, including webinar and webcasting services. The platform has been ranked at number one by top ten reviews and, of course, is being used to power today's event. To learn more, visit OnStreamMedia.com. Now allow me to introduce our moderator today. Michelle Bruno is a writer, blogger, and technology journalist. She develops content and content strategies for event industry technology companies at Bruno Group Signature Services. She writes about event innovation at Fork in the Road blog and publishes Event Tech Brief, a weekly, a weekly newsletter and website on event technology. Michelle, thanks for joining us. Let's get started. Thank you so much, Arlene. As always, that was a wonderful introduction. I want to begin this webinar introducing our contributors today. Uh, first of all, you can read their full bios on the TSNN website, but I want to just give you, give you the highlights on, first of all, Francis Friedman. He is a professional marketer and branding and business building expert. He is recognized as a futurist in the trade show and events industry. He has been in the industry for more than 25 years, and my most vivid memory of Francis, and you don't even know this, Francis, is you sitting on the floor in one of the convention centers during an Expo Expo, on the floor, cross-legged, with all of your acolytes sitting on the floor around you, looking up all doughy-eyed at you, and you were saying something as I went up the escalator, and so that was my first exposure to you. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to what you have to say today, and especially after reading your wonderful book. Flattery will get you next, everywhere. <laughs> our next presenter will be Andrea Barr. She is Vice President of Exposition and Events at the Texas Restaurant Association, but Andrea has been with DMG, she's been with the Society of Petroleum Engineers, with the, the huge SPE Offshore Technology Conference, and the Texas Association of Appraisal Districts. And I, what I love about Andrea is every time I see her, she says, tell me what's going on, tell me what's new, I want to know what's happening out there. So she is going to be our poster child for event organizers during this discussion. And our last but, of course, not least, presenter is Dahlia Elgazar, who is a speaker, educator, consultant. You can throw everything but the kitchen sink at her, and she does it all beautifully. She also picked her own title for her company, her position at her company, which is Dahlia Plus. She's the brand visionaire, idea igniteur, and the net weaver at Dahlia Plus, but she also does these really cool tech bars, a lot of our industry conferences and elsewhere, where people can come in, learn about technology, ask questions about technology, and actually sometimes touch it, like this really cool petting zoo. So I'm going to move on to the actual discussion, which um, is going to go like this. 
first, Francis will tell us all about what he's written, which is fabulous, about what's going to happen in the industry very shortly and what is actually happening while we may not admit it or not. He's going to lay it out for us. And then Andrea is going to give us a perspective, um, you know, from the from the viewpoint of trade show organizers. And then Dahlia is going to help us understand what's out there in terms of event technology and innovation to see if we can actually, as an industry and with event technology companies, handle this massive change that's coming down. So first of all, Francis, um, I just saw these stats from the Center for Exhibition Industry Research. It was also republished on TSNN. It tells us that the industry is doing pretty good. We've got a 2.6% year-over-year gain in the first quarter of 2016. It was our 23rd consecutive quarter of year-on-year -year growth. Exhibitions have outperformed the macroeconomy. Macro the exhibition industry is continuing to show steady and consistent performance. Everything's great, right? Well, I think we need to put it in context. If we go back historically and take a look at the fact that, let's say, 30 years ago, the trade show industry had all of the marbles. There was no place else to go, so everybody came to the trade show industry. But as time has moved on and software and other capabilities have come along, our relative share of information transfer has been declining. So that today everybody is looking at websites, we're looking at blogs, we're looking at virtual reality, we're looking at all kinds of technologies that distribute information that historically only existed behind the walls of a trade show facility. So on a relative share of information, relatively share, relative share of influence, relative share of budget, we're actually in decline. So while our industry is up 2.6%, and if we took inflation out of that and said inflation was flat, relatively speaking, yes, we're showing that, but we're just sort of crawling along and relatively sliding down the banister, if you will, in terms of relative influence in the distribution of marketing information and marketing cloud. So in the book, you mentioned some very specific threats to the trade show industry, and I'm wondering if you could... Just give us the, the highlights of what those threats are today. Sure. Let's take an example that uh, we all use. Let's say we want to go on a site visit uh, to look at a property. So it might cost the property $1,000 to host us, and it might cost us another $500. And in doing the site visit, we would engage an airline, a hotel, cabs, meals, entertainment. But let's say next year that site has a really, really terrific virtual reality tour of their facility. Question, are we going to get on an airplane and fly there or not? So if we don't go there, the $1,500 for that site visit disappears off of our books. The time out of the office stays. The efficiency for the site stays. Everybody walks away happy. But in terms of our industry, airline, hotel, travel, being on site to physically see the property, that's gone away. Now, do we say that's a win or do we say that's a lose? You also talk about exhibitors themselves being a threat. So it's sort of like this enemy within scenario. Can you just touch on that a little bit too? Sure. Salesforce.com used to attend and participate in public trade shows. Salesforce.com decided they wanted to do their own private trade show event. They had 135,000 registrations for their event off their customer base. Let's say 50,000 of those people actually showed up. And 50,000 of those people spent two days at Salesforce.com, private event, not a public trade show. That's 100,000 person days off of public trade show floors. And let's say uh, that those person days are worth $1,000 each. Okay. There's over a million dollars, I haven't done the number in my head, but there's millions of dollars at stake that did not get spent on a public trade show floor. And if we look at all of the technology companies who are doing their own events that way, same way, those are millions and millions and millions of dollars that do not come into public trade show producer coffers. 
it goes to the vendor community, and that's very viable, but it does not come to the owners and organizers of public trade shows. I'm going to throw a poll out there. Um, Hello? I'm on. Great. Sorry about that. Somehow I got disconnected. Anyway, um, the poll results should be in. Are they showing on the screen? So, Francis, you're still here and you can hear me? I can hear you. Okay. I'm not sure why. Um... Okay, the results are here. Let's just keep going. Okay, there you are. Okay. We're talking about the, um, the attendee imperative. Okay. Um, why do you feel that the focus should be on attendees in okay. your new paradigm? Let's do this. Let's take a look at it. Let's look at my background. My background is as a professional packaged goods marketer. My mm -hmm. first executive, my first position, which ultimately ended up as an executive position, was managing major consumer packaged goods brands in commodity categories like coffee, popcorn, mustard, and so on. In those categories, the competition is straight across the board and very intense. So if we transfer that same kind of thinking, which was a, in essence a 24-7 show, in other words, those products were on the shelf 24-7 competing with each other, the win was that customers picked those products up and took them home. So mm -hmm. transferring it to our industry, if we had a hall filled with exhibitors and nobody showed up, would we have a second show? No. Conversely, if I had a hall filled with buyers and I went out to a group of exhibitors and said, hey, I got all these buyers, are you interested? Absolutely, I could fill that hall. So what's happening now is that the electronic community is competing for eyeballs, for the attendee, for hearts and minds. And if we look at the different models, and I'll just take a moment here, the trade show model is we, are, we define ourselves as, as organizers. In the public show model, they define themselves as producers. In the concert world, they define themselves as promoters. The website community, the website uh, industry defines itself as building community or tribe. So, and in that case, when they then sell whatever they sell and decide to produce a trade show or a public event of some sort, they bring their community to that event. Mm -hmm. And because they already have the community of potential buyers and interest people who are interested, it's very relatively very easy for them to sell exhibitors who want to be in front of them. The perfect mm -hmm. parallel model for us here now is the hosted buyer event because the producer of a hosted buyer event says, I have pre-qualified buyers. My job was to pre-qualify buyers. I have them. Are you interested? And certainly mm -hmm. they're then able to bring sellers into a room who might pay them. I'm just going to make up a number. I don't know that this is a real number. I'm just making it up. Lots of dollars, far beyond the booth cost, to have a half an hour presentation to a pre-qualified buyer. And let's say that that uh, organizer brings in 100 pre-qualified buyers. That seller could walk out the door with millions of dollars in orders. No wasted circulation, no wasted time, no wasted anything. So if we switch our model from organizing booths on a trade show floor to being the leader or the builder of branded product that attendees want to buy, we will have no problem convincing marketers and advertisers that whatever it is we have to offer in our individual show is worth their devoting the budget to it and supporting it completely. What we hear now is, I need more attendees. And the, the book goes into long discussions about value and things like that, but I'll stop right here. <clears throat> if I had an army of attendees, I could sell all kinds of booth space. Let me put it that way very clearly, very cleanly. Great. What's the modern digital trade show model? It's a branded model. So if we start off by recognizing that our show is a product, it's a branded product, a branded product, we then can take a look at the configuration of that product. So, for example, let's compare fast food brands. Let's compare a Starbucks 
to a mm-hmm. Dunkin' Donuts or a Starbucks to a Seven. Let's compare Starbucks to Seven Eleven. Mm-hmm. Starbucks has positioned its brand as a community for which it charges very large prices, relatively speaking, for a cup of coffee. People mm-hmm. come there. They stay there. They hang out there. They talk about it. They go through all kinds of machinations, and they have a very, very large community. 7-Eleven sells coffee also, but it's a transaction. You walk in, grab your coffee, walk out. Different kind of community, different brand, different brand attributes, different expectations of that brand. So if we start the modern digital trade show viewing itself as a branded product that is then digitally centered, in other words, all of the, fa- all of the functioning of the brand is through digital capabilities, and it's focused on our attendees, what it delivers is high-value content. It, the content is value-rich. People want it. It's intensively marketed, and we make more money. Starbucks mm-hmm. makes a lot more money on a percentage basis than 7-Eleven. Mm-hmm. Starbucks, so, in its own way, is an MD, is a modern digital trade show, in its own way. Uh-huh. So you talk a lot about in the book, as you just have, about uh, the trade shows becoming brands and that now trade show organizers will have to sort of market their their trade show as a product and as a brand. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you you go so far as to say the, the trade show manager might have to be a brand manager or we might have to get rid of trade show managers and just have brand managers. Talk a little bit about that. That's kind of crazy. Well, actually, we, we are brand managers. We just don't know it. And why, okay. why do I say this? Because in the pre-show literature, we're making a brand promise. We say to the mm-hmm. exhibitors, if you come to the show, we're going to deliver such and such and so and so. It's a brand promise. We say to the attendees, if you come to this show, you're going to get such and such and so and so. So when I first came into this industry 25 years ago, the, the general statement to attendees was all together, at, to exhibitors rather, was all together at one place at one time. Mm-hmm. Well, it wasn't true. We didn't have all of a particular industry together at one place at one time. Mm-hmm. But now as copy is being written by different shows and more research is coming to bear on the shows, shows are using more research, the brand promise is becoming more refined. Mm-hmm. It is a brand promise, just like if you go out and buy, let's say, Folgers Coffee, which was a brand I managed, Folgers Mountain Grown Coffee. Mm -hmm. Now, Folgers happened to have taken that early on and owned that line because the truth is lots of coffee is grown in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Lots of coffee grown in mountains goes in lots of other brands. But Folgers occupied that brand space. Let's call it a space in the mind of people, just like we have an image of Starbucks in our mind. We have an image of Dunkin' Donuts in our mind. We have an image of Subway. All of those are very well-crafted, clear brand positioning statements or positionings, if you will, in people's mind. So today, CES has a certain positioning. NAB has a certain positioning. World of Concrete has a certain positioning. So as we go through these shows that we know, we can think about how that show fits in the larger world of trade shows. But we get into categories where there are two or three or four or five shows in a year in the same cycle, Mm -hmm. let's say in the hotel industry or across the restaurant industry. There are shows all over the country in the restaurant industry. Mm-hmm. How are those shows positioned and branded, and how do the managers, now called show managers or show directors, think about managing that show as a brand that needs to occupy certain space in our mind with certain characteristics, which we then build high-value aspects of in the actual show itself? So, for example, a high-value aspect of a food trade show may very well mm-hmm. be um, world-class chefs doing demonstrations. Mm-hmm. But, value, you know, the, the value the, Yeah. 
the one thing that, that was really intriguing is if we accept that uh, trade shows of the future will be brands and we market them as brands, so many more products are now possible. Certainly. So talk about that. If we look at BizBash as a model of uh, a modern digital trade show, and if we look at uh, uh, something called Blog Her, the Blog Her Conference, each of these started as online communities first, <clears throat> and they built their following. With, I'm going to stick with uh, uh, BizBash. They built their following among their group and then started doing product differentiation. So, for example, they extended the brand to an in-person event. So David Adler and his team took the BizBash online community and created a BizBash event. They then created BizBash magazines. They then created BizBash newsletters. Marketingprofs.com, same way, started online, and now they have a whole series of product offerings under the Marketing Profs brand name. So if we look at um, General Motors as a large brand, they have a series of car brands underneath that. General Electric, all the major companies. One of the interesting aspects of branding for me are the Japanese companies because Yamaha, for example, has motorcycles, musical instruments, heavy-duty industries. It's one of the unique aspects of branding that's an anomaly for what we normally accept in branding. But mm -hmm. coming back to us, so why not a brand manager then start to look at how do I diversify my XYZ show brand into directories, into online training? into meetings, into newsletters, into webinars, into a whole series that creates a product line under my brand name. Long-term example is, the Dove, is mm -hmm. Dove, the Dove Bar brand name. It started off as a bar, as a bar of soap, <clears throat> and David Ogilvy recognized that 35% of the composition of that bar of soap was skin care. Mm -hmm. And so they built the essential platform for that brand on skincare. But today, there are 150 items, including a whole series of men's items that have slowly been added under the Dove brand name based on the characteristics of skincare. Mm -hmm. So that's a great segue into, I think, content as, you know, Organizers in the future, you say, are going to pretty much have to be content machines. Absolutely. Pushing it out 24-7 every day. But it's not going to be the kind of content that we see now. It's not the, here's, we just added a new speaker, and we, you know, now we have this new programming element. What kind of content are you, content are you talking about, and how is that going to work? Part of branding is to be an integral part. Part of what I'm proposing for our industry is to be an integral part of the industry, whatever industry sector the show serves, mm -hmm. on a 24-7 basis. In many cases today, we know how to organize in order to move things onto a trade show floor, but many teams don't really understand the fundamentals of the industry that they're working with. And what I'm suggesting is the deeper we know and understand the specific industry that we work in, and become part of that community, the easier it will be for us to get the inside stories that we might publish to talk to thought leaders in that industry, to become a thought leader ourselves as that show. Mm -hmm. uh, BizBash, for example, is a thought leader. BizBash is in that. BizBash publishes every single day in a number of different categories. Now, certainly BizBash is in an industry that has a lot going on. They're in the entertainment and public relations business. There may be industries that don't have that much going on. So the fallback position might be interviews with key exhibitors, or I'm sorry, key executives in that industry, government mm -hmm. officials, so that the show demonstrates in the, let's say, 10-year future, in the Internet of Everything, it is part of the Internet of Everything related to that industry. Right now, in many cases, the show becomes something to think about three months before the show happens, so we go to sleep the rest of the year around that show. Mm -hmm. Given the competition okay. that's going to take place through virtual reality and other technologies uh, not now invented, and as we look forward to what's called 5G, which is the next step beyond 4G communications, 
Mm-hmm. 5G is that much faster, will allow visual to go that much faster. I mean, there's this whole series of things about 5G that will totally disrupt the way in which we communicate with each other right now. And if we also look at the fact that our exhibitors necessarily do not want to spend any more money than they have to, and if, let's say, they're doing 10 shows right now and they could cut that down to eight and make up the two-show difference through um, electronic communications, they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. They're going to do it. Certainly the 10x10s and the 10x20s need trade shows in order Mm -hmm. to have access to market. But the public trade show industry cannot live on 10x10s and 10x20s alone. So I'm going to actually skip to um, another thing that, I, that I've thought about and I think is very interesting. You're, you're proposing a shakeup, and you've talked about what we as organizers need to do to, um, you know, make our customers happy, give them a good experience, all of these things that will impact attendees and exhibitors. But what about everybody else? We need, Where do you we need see... partners. We need this ecosystem. Right. And those partners need to understand our new business model so they can move yeah. as quickly as we're going to move. We, we cannot move without this ecosystem. This ecosystem has to be part of our team. This is not going to go away. But what's also happening with this ecosystem is they're also producing private events. Mm-hmm. They're going to thrive in the future as, uh, let's say, major exhibitors look to say, okay, I can reach my customers electronically, and since I'm reaching them electronically, why don't I also then bring them together? I don't need a public show organizer, but I need this ecosystem. And it's happening today. This is happening today. Somebody produces the developer events for all the major technology companies, even though they're hosted privately by the technology company. Somebody produced the Salesforce.com private event that did not end up on a public trade show floor. So this ecosystem, I think, is going to get stronger as time goes on because they're going to do more non-public show events. So the switch is going to be, I create a community off of my corporation. I'm just going to pick GE just for an example. So GE says, as part of our total relationship and total brand awareness building with our universe, we're going to host them in a series of public events around the, around the year and around the world. For that, I need a Freeman, for example, or I need a GES, or I need whoever else, plus an AV company, plus, plus, plus. So this ecosystem that you have on the screen will do very well. My concern is the public trade show organizer will lose that business. Mm-hmm. So I want to I want to shift the discussion to Andrea, our poster child for the event organizer community. Andrea, where's there's going to be a lot of change. We are going to focus on brands. There will be organi- organizational structure changes, staffing levels, job skills, work processes, the pace at which we're accustomed to working. It's all going to change, and it's all going to require additional investment. So where's the money going to come from? That is such an excellent question. Um, we are facing this in our conference right now is um, the finding the, the audience. And if you get the audience, then the uh, exhibitors will come. And then finding out, we're, we're investigating that right now as to if that's going to be from the exhibitor or from the sponsor or is it from the attendee. And we're, we're struggling with that and learning through that process today. But do you think you think you'll you'll have to shift budget from you know is it a, a Rob Peter to pay Paul sort of scenario where you have to bring in new revenue streams or is it all of the above? All of the above. I think everything has to change. The way we are thinking about putting on our shows right now has to change, and in that includes. Um, our revenue streams and, and what we offer the attendee, what we offer the exhibitor, every, everything's going to have to change from what we're used to thinking. Mm-hmm. So another point that um, Francis makes in the, books, in the book uh, is really targets these fundamental changes in the roles of an operations person and the role of a salesperson. 
So operations is now going to have to be also concerned with the technology, the software, the Wi-Fi, the on-site data collection, in addition to all of their other operational duties. And I guess I'm talking to you, Andrea, because from an operational perspective, you've got to take on all of this new stuff. Uh, likewise, sales, they're selling new products. They're selling a, a wider, you know, breadth of offerings. They have to work more closely with marketing. They have to work with communications and the technology departments. It's not just going to be dialing for dollars anymore. So, you know, how is that going to impact the way that uh, event organizers behave, and how are you going to approach these changes tactically? Event organizers are have always had a lot to do and have always had a lot on their plate, and now we have to be a, a master of all trades. You mm -hmm. really have to know a little bit about a lot of things and, be, and surround yourself with partners, be they internal partners or external partners, that can give you the um, advice and experience you need to accomplish all of these things. And, uh, yes, you, your sales team and your marketing team are really go hand in hand. Everything we do right now goes through both departments. If sales puts it out, we run it through marketing because we're, again, that brand, we literally just had an entire brand meeting that everything has to be the brand. And what is that mm -hmm. brand? And who? what is it that you're trying to, to show yourself to be to the world? Um, and yes, it's about your partners, internal and external, and it's about having really great places to go to get information if you don't want to go to school to get a degree in all of these 15 million things that requires to run mm -hmm. a great show. Mm -hmm. If there were a school. Right, if there were, as if. Yeah, and Michelle, this comes back to um, the initial diagram that you showed, digitally centered. Yeah. The corporation, the, the trade show producer, corporation, whatever, has to build the systems to actually facilitate this. These are not, you know, indi necessarily individual systems. So the the upstream part of this is how do we understand a trade show organization or an association and integrate an entire data suite that will be able to produce the data, make it available at a desktop or on a handset for ops or at a desktop or on a handset for sales so that it's immediately available. And that's a big step ahead. That's a three to five year step ahead to be able to have an integrated suite of products that capture the data, prepare it in a form that people can use, and then continue to track it and, and keep the data up to speed so that the company can operate. Well, it sounds to me, Andrea, like it's going to be sort of this, you know, two steps forward, one step back. Um, there might be some failures. How are you as, you know, as the trade show organizer representative going to manage? We don't like failure. We don't like testing sometimes. How do you feel? Uh, you're right. We don't like failure or testing, and certainly our boards, when you're coming from the association perspective, they don't like failure either. Unfortunately, we have to do that. We either try something and, and watch it fail or allow it to fail to learn what works. And in, if we are not constantly improving, then we will lose our audience because somebody else is constantly improving. If we're not constantly branding ourselves and, and looking at what our, our attendees want, what our exhibitors want, there's so much competition out there that we will lose. So either we, we test and fail, with test with the opportunity of failing or succeeding, or we die. Well, that's putting it mildly. <laughs> well, so, I, I just suspect that if, if we I, I couldn't agree more. I've, yeah. Now you know why I wrote the book. Now you know why I wrote the book. She's just said it perfectly. That's why I wrote the book. Yeah, test or die, innovate or die. So Francis says in the book, we're going to need top-down support from leadership. We now need to create these cross-functional teams, so people need to wear multiple hats, and we all have to work together and, and really align ourselves with each other. And we need to have a comprehensive roadmap to, you know, go forward. What do you think is doable? Andrea. Oh, Andrea, okay. Talking to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Talking yeah. to me? 
<laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, it's really going to create require a great deal of education up. So, again, to, of the many hats that a show organizer gets to wear, we have to educate our board of, of this new model. We have to educate our leadership of this new model. And associations in particular have a, a propensity to dislike radical change. Um, so it will require a great deal of education and patience to repeat, here's where we're going and, and why, here's why we're going there and here's why that investment is needed and, and why we need to have these partners and continue to evolve and continue to educate our leadership and our team to keep up with that pace. Well, you know, I hear you saying that, but do you think that, I mean, we're not the only ones talking about this massive transformation. Do you think leadership is listening right now? I mean, I know we have to continue to educate them, but, I mean, what are they waiting for? A lightning strike. Um, Elizabeth. Uh, <laughs> Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, the doctor who studied um, death and dying, yeah. has five stages of that. The first one is denial. Mm -hmm. We don't want to believe that it's changing the way it has. It's stayed like that. But the rate of change is moving so quickly that I can appreciate what our colleague has just talked about, that particularly yeah. if you're further along the line in your career and you've had a career of 30 or 35 or 40 years of the same thing. This mm -hmm. rate of change, and particularly what's coming ahead, is just totally beyond what you could easily comprehend even three years ago, even three years ago. So the first step yeah. in, in this whole process is denial, and the second step is anger. Why are you coming to me? Why do you want so much money? Why can't you focus <laughs> along with what you got? Yeah. When I was your age, do, we did such and such and <laughs> so and so. Do more with less. I like that one. So but here's, oh, yeah. here's an example that we can go back to. How many yeah. of you remember Blockbuster Video, all the Blockbuster stores, right? Yeah. Block, Blockbuster itself was a trade show. You went there, you walked up and down the aisles, picked out what you wanted from that, brought it up to the counter, took it home, played it. Mm -hmm. Then you took it back. And then something called Netflix came along, which said you don't have to go to the store, you don't have to pay it, Mm -hmm. Have a subscription, and I'll download it to you. Blockbuster, at its height, had 60,000 employees and 9,000 stores, and it doesn't exist today. It didn't make the change. It didn't see what was happening. It didn't see that people no longer want to go to a store and pick out videotape when they could have it at home downloaded at will. Mm -hmm. Major, major example, and we're not, I'm not saying that we're going to go away like that, but it is a transition from what is today to what happened for them, at least, in the future. And Andrea's got her finger on that, and I think our industry, many people in our industry are beginning to understand that. Unfortunately, many in our industry don't understand that yet. So, so Andrea, vendor relationships, Vendor relationships are so important. Um, you need to know that they are truly in partnership with you. They need to continue to be on the cutting edge of what they know, and you need to be them. And, and finding a place, you know, I know vendors need to be uh, on the cut, their cutting edge so they can be the best product they are, and they're going to try to tell you that they are the best at what they do. So, again, um, organizers have to find out really is my vendor the best one out there and in addition that's a partnership you need to push your your vendors to be the best that they can be know on your own have some sort of knowledge that your vendor is pushing to be cutting edge and that they're not going to be outdated in two years and really grow together and make that partnership because you each require each other and you you must communicate with one another and really, really move forward together, cutting edge. Boss Michelle again. So I'll keep talking. Um, yeah, I will I'm also back. say that, that, um, that with our partners, we rely on them greatly because they do so many shows. And what have you seen and what have you heard? 
and um, we, we work with their knowledge and what they've seen and what they've experienced as well. Francis, what do you? Yeah, absolutely. If the vendors aren't keeping up, and you may very well have to change vendors because your needs may outgrow their capacity and their capability. But they, too, have to hire the best of breed. And in many of the, certainly in the data and electronic skill sets, a lot of those skill sets are in short demand, or short supply, rather, with high demand, so that the staff that they have may leave and go to uh, someone else who will pay them more money because they need that particular skill. So, and you're absolutely correct. You've got to stay on top of how skilled your vendors are, and are they providing you with thought leadership, and are they pushing you to reach to the next step as they see it being done somewhere else in the industry or as they've thought about it, and they want to take you to that next higher level. Well, one example that I saw with vendors that I think strengthens partnerships is uh, where trade show organizers bring their vendors together and create some sort of partnership summit. And to be honest, this becomes like a brainstorming session where there's creative ideas to challenges that a trade show might have or that they want to take that transformation, so to speak, to the next level. And so this is where they need to depend on their vendors to be creative strategists and have that conversation. And I think trade show organizers as well as associations are doing it more and more with all their tech vendors or partners. And it's becoming to a point where actually this would might be the only time that the tech vendors speak to each other. So it strengthens that data ecosystem that, for instance, that you talk about in your book. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of advantages to having that happen. The other piece part that I would suggest needs to be added in here are not only the vendors that produce the show, but um, strategic planning vendors, people who are in market research, who are looking out into the larger community. I mean, one of the things that the trade show industry does, generally does not talk about is reaching outside of the current attendee base to create larger communities further afield on a development basis. We have a lot of conversation about attendees on site, you know, how we engage them and do all of that kind of stuff. But how we don't have a lot of conversation about how do we expand the potential universe who might then become attendees. It's a whole other conversation, and I talk about it in the book, and we don't have the time to go into that at the moment. So, Francis, you, you do talk about the importance of customer experience and design and management. Right. Can you kind of just run through this list for sure. us um, before we ask Dahlia about what's out there for on-site experience technologies? There's a new job coming out called Customer Experience Design manager. It goes into neuroscience. It goes into the way in which people consume space, the way in which people think about things and pay attention. It's very neurologically based, but it then translates into how do we lay out a trade show floor? How do we map the floor? Journey mapping. These are things that are coming along. So the question that we want to look at is the whole experience. In other words, we need to find out before people get there what is it they want and what are they willing to pay for. People will tell you that they want lots of things, but when you actually nail them down, you'll find that maybe nine out of ten they're not willing to pay for. We need to produce events that people are willing to pay for, and they go, I'm willing to give you X amount of dollars and Y amount of time to be there. So the examples I use with clients is $1,500 cost and three days of time. So when you go to your boss and fill out a request for travel, and is that show or is that event or conference or whatever else it is worth $1,500 and three days out of the office? Yeah. The way we would know that is that the programming is focused and it's high value. It fits. It engages the opportunity. So it also provides the opportunity for engagement. So if I go to this event, I'm going to meet six other people who very well could be a partner of mine. It's the community. I can network in the community. Plus, fun is an important part for millennials. We talk about uh, uh, games and things like that. Fun is a very important part for these audiences coming along. And then we need to be able to demonstrate an ROI. When that attendee goes back home and the boss says, what did you get? They can go, I met this person, I saw that conference, I learned about this, and here's how I can apply it back on the job. That's part of the high-value component of producing what we're going to produce as we go forward. So, Dahlia, 
we have this sort of laundry list of on-site experience technologies to make it fun and compelling and rich and make people want to come. And we've talked about some of them, you know, recently, and there are others that are coming down the, you know, pipeline. But where are the technology providers at with this list? Are there products out there? Are they getting any traction? What say you? <laughs> Well, I mean, this is a laundry list of, of fun and as well as interactive technology, and they definitely should be part of the event experience, whatever the event is. You know, these, these type of technologies, the drones, the virtual reality, holograms, all that you see on this list, they definitely exist. Um, I always keep the example of the Minority Report movie, uh, mm -hmm. Tom Cruise and all of that, and that was 14 years ago. Not to say that how old we are or what have you, but um, you know, the the great thing about this list, Michelle, is that it it definitely exists, and they are definitely getting um, you know involved with events as well as creating experiences. Like Francis was saying, you have all these segments, the millennials, and then you have. You know, it depends on the demographics and the sociographics of the event participants, but mm -hmm. these types of technologies appeal to everyone because what you are creating is you're creating new experiences. And then let's talk about the data. Like even virtual reality, holograms, you know, um, augmented reality, there's a push and pull of data that happens with all these cool technologies. And that's what a trade show organizer or a digital marketer would want to know. So um, to answer your question, they definitely exist and they should be um, integrated in any type of event going forward. I'm glad you mentioned data because we're going to need to rely on data even more and we need, you know, we have to keep doing this continuous research. We have to look at the data from the technologies that we have and those that we'll have in the future. We have to keep doing these ongoing metric assessments to make sure we're on the right track. But our industry has this love-hate relationship with data. So what's going on in the technology community and what are they going to be able to do to solve these sort of pressing problems, knowing that we, we need to rely on data more than ever before? And, and you're, you're spot on with what you said. There is a love and hate relationship with data, but it's coming to a point right now because of the flux and the overwhelming information that's coming our way. And like Francis pointed out, you know, technology is, is moving very, very, very quickly. And because it's moving very quickly and because of consumer behavior, which sort of governs what happens on an event level, you know, mm -hmm. the amount of user-generated marketing, so to speak, or um, intel or content more so than anything, those are all indicators and have data points that have to be measured and analyzed somehow. So mm -hmm. trade show organizers and the C-suite and, you know, everybody that's involved has to put together not only a digital ecosystem, they have to put together a solid um, infrastructure that is based on the data and it's integrated. Right now, the, the hate relationship that they have with data is because a lot of their data is siloed. They don't know the, po the touch points and um, with their event participants. You know, sometimes their systems, when they say, yes, the data is integrated, it truly isn't. So this is, this is first and foremost like a big mission for for uh, event organizers that want to stay alive and not die. They have to truly mm -hmm. figure out how to um, put together a solid system in place where all their data can be looked at and analyzed at one spot. Yeah, absolutely. That's part of the integrated data, the data centering of our industry going forward. Mm -hmm. So I want to um, ask Dahlia about your thoughts um, Francis, on this idea of hacking. And you refer to hacking in the book as a good thing. 
um, hacking allows us to find solutions for the things that are aggravating and broken and, uh, you know, present horrible experiences for us. So I sort of pose to Dahlia um, this list of questions that you asked in the book, Francis, and asking Dahlia, what's, what's hackable? What, are there hacks out there that we just don't know about? What should we hack? Um, certainly, there's lots of stuff out there. There are lots of, you know, things that are broken that are hackable. So what do you think about that? So, Francis, I think the hacking part or the section that you have in your book is one of my favorites. And some of the examples that you gave, which are so in our faces every single day right now, like, for example, Uber right. is a hack. And Uber, I can't live without Uber. I don't know anybody on this webinar who can't live without Uber or Lyft at the moment. Airbnb is a hack. So, therefore, if you look at the trade show, you're te what you do at trade shows and what you do at any type of meetings and events is you have to take a look at your consumer behaviors. Your consumer behaviors will tell you what you can hack or they will hack it for you. They will go and do their own brain dates. They will go and do their own meetups their own way. So anything within the event industry or event sphere basically is hackable at the moment. One thing that I would say, though, is with the hacks and with all the technology that's happening at the moment is one, it's not only like what um, Andrea was saying, you have to educate the C-suites or the internal teams. Truly, you also have to educate your event participants on the technology that you are introducing. And the reason I say that is because a lot of times if you have drones and, you know, there's a content capture feature to it, or if you have virtual reality and they're going down an aisle and booths and, you know, you can do an overlay, for example, of information for different types of products that they might be interested in, you need to educate them on what these technologies can do for them as well as educate them on the security what type of information is passed from their mobile device to the event organizer, for example, and put them at ease with the technology. Because then you can implement more on site. And, you know, talking about a hack, trade shows the way they are, 10 by 10s, 10 by 20s, 40 by 40s, that's hackable. People right now tend to gravitate to tech playgrounds. They tend to gravitate to pods. They tend to gravitate, gravitate to self-demos. If you put a playground together and a bunch of drones and someone's having a race, that's a hack. The drone doesn't have to have a 10 by 10. The drone company doesn't have to have a 10 by 10 to showcase what they can do for the event participants. Sure. So this is where the creativity just jumps in, and you use technology to make it even more fun. It sticks more. It generates more user content, and that – creates the buzz, and your event marketing gets even stronger and stronger for events to come. Sure. Even form can be hacked. Just a quick note for our team. When we say hack, it means cut through all the undergrowth that, and form of whatever it is you're doing. For example, golf. In San Diego, four golf courses are expanding the cup to 15 inches. Why? Because millennials don't have the time to practice to get their game high enough to be able to spend the time four to six hours on a regular course trying to put a small ball in a small cup. With a 15-inch hole, they, a cup rather, they don't have to spend the time practicing because they don't need to be that accurate. And they can cut the time of the game down, to, a, a match rather, down to about three, three and a half hours. Also, they can play soccer golf and frisbee golf. So just another way to hack form and rethink things. Well, Francis, I'm, I'm going to leave it to you to sort of give us the industry mandate. And I want to let everyone know I, I realize that we've come to the end of our hour. We will answer questions for those people that still want to ask them. Um, so just hang in there. We'll go a little bit over, and thank you for your patience. So, Francis, what do we have to do now? This is all so much. We need to take, pick our head up from looking down at one square foot of space and say, what's it going to be like three years from now at the rate things are going? And say to ourselves, if I were to start fresh and considered myself a website or a web community, what would I offer? So I'd certainly have content in order to keep that web community running. I'd certainly have to have things of interest to talk about. And I'd certainly have to have people of interest and interesting 
to get everybody together. And I would use that as the guideline and then say, okay, if that's the case, what are the tools that I need to actually do that? And go out mm-hmm. and find those tools. Break the rules, think new thoughts, push further ahead and say, what would it take for me to want to consume that? If I went into a store and looked at things, what would I actually want to have to make it fun for me? And if I wanted to do that for my father, who would be that much older than I am, what would he need? How would I need to talk to him? And if I wanted to talk to Grandpa, how would I talk to him? And it's that kind of thinking that allows us to then at least make some segmentation in our thinking and say, okay, for my group, let's say up to 35-year-olds, I need to have these kinds of neat little interesting kinds of things. And for the 35 to 50-year-olds, I need to have these kind of things. And for the 50-plus, I need to have those kind of things. And if we do it that way and say, what would they be interested in? It's like giving a gift at Father's Day or Grandfather's Day or Christmas. You want to give them a gift that everybody opens the gift and says, wow, that is the greatest thing. How did you know I wanted that? And if we use that, that analogy, I wanted that, how did you know? And then figure out what the tools are, we'll be very, we'll be very well served going forward. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to take some questions. Uh, I don't I don't see them appearing in my screen though. I see four questions in the red box and let's see what the questions are. Go for it. Um hmm. mm-hmm, mm-hmm. quite truthfully, I have no idea how to open the questions. Let's go to we've got poll questions, material, speakers. Michelle, this is Arlene from TSN. Yeah. You you have one question, I think, handy uh, nearby, but otherwise we're good. Would you would you um, mind reading the four questions that are there? Nope. Those were technical questions. So people oh. can email questions though directly to any of our mm-hmm. panelists or the moderator, or they can use hashtag TSN webinar, and we will get those addressed. Um, otherwise, maybe we can just move to the contact page and thank our sponsors, and the recording will be sent to everybody who has registered. Yes, thank you so much, Francis, Andrea, Dahlia, and of course, um, thank you to our sponsors. And hopefully, you've gotten a lot out of this presentation. Francis's book, um, quote me if I'm wrong, Francis, is coming out the end of July, beginning of August. I urge everyone to read it. We've just given you the highlights, but there's so much useful information, uh, checklists and and graphics and all kinds of great things. Um, Hopefully, it will be the beginning of a very um, fruitful conversation for the industry going forward. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's webcast. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time and have a great day.